topics. Um, so I'm a low dimensional topologist. Um, and what I like to do is I like to use Hager for homology, um, which is a package of three and four manifold invariants defined by Oshawa and Szabo. Um, there's also a, a not invariant in the Hager for homology package. And so I like to use these tools to answer questions in low dimensional topology. So I like to um, think about you know surgery questions. So that's you know when you have a knot in a three manifold and you remove it and you glue something back in in a different way. Um, and I also like to think about concordance, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So I should start by telling you what the knot concordance group is. So, uh, so we'll consider knots in S3. So it's just a, a smooth embedding of a circle into the three sphere. So here are some examples of knots. Um, our, our knots are going to be oriented. Um, so there's an um, operation on knots called the connected sum. It's easiest to just show you what it is. So you just have two knots and um, you connect them. And you do it in the way that preserves the orientation. Great. <coughs> so, so if you consider the set of knots in S3, under the operation of connected sum, and we always think of knots up to isotopy. Well, this is a monoid, right? So, so for example, we didn't change the isotopic class of this knot um, when we did the connected sum. So the, the, the unknot, which is just the you know, sort of standard circle, um, that's the identity in this monoid. Um, but it turns out that we're missing inverses. So we'd rather, we'd rather have a group than a monoid. So the solution to this is we're going to uh, quotient out by an equivalence relation called concordance. So the equivalence relation is that uh, two knots, k1 and k2, are concordant uh, if and only if uh, k1 and k2 uh, co-bound a smooth properly embedded cylinder. in S3 across the unit interval. So you think of K1 as sitting in S3 cross 0, and K2 sitting in S3 cross i, and you have the cylinder between them, such that on one end, the boundary of your cylinder is K1, and on the other end, on the boundary of your cylinder is K2. Um, so since this is happening in S3 cross i, which is a four manifold, so maybe this is a little hard to see. So let me give you an example of what um, such a concordance can look like. And so, so how am I going to show you an example that's happening in four dimensions? Well, you can think of the i direction as time. So at each time, we see a slice that's a copy of S3. And that's something that, that we can see good enough. <coughs> So, so starting on one end, um, we'll start with this knot. Okay. Okay. And so, so how many, and so <coughs> I'm going to draw the knot that we see at each time slice, and I'm also going to draw the surface that we're sweeping out in, in S3 cross I. So, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to perform an isotopy. And so if we're just performing an isotope, we're just sort of wiggling or not around. So in terms of the surface that we see in S3 cross I, well, it's just going to look like a cylinder. <coughs> and so then what's going to happen next is when we perform the isotope, those two, those two points are going to come together. And so in terms of the surface, well, it's going to create a saddle point. So right, so right here, um, topologically, this looks like a wedge of two circles. So the cross section of the surface is going to look like a wedge of two circles. And then as we continue down, well, this is going to split apart in the opposite direction that those strands came together. So 
right? So it's just splitting apart in the opposite direction. And so now if you look, this is the two component link. And so in terms of the surface, well, now it looks like this. And now if you stare at this, this is actually the two component unlink, right? So you can sort of pull this piece down um, and then the two, the two components come apart. And so since um, <coughs> we have two unknots and they're, they're not linked in any way, um, we can cap off one of the components with a disk. So we have this sort of pair of pants here and we'll cap off one of the legs with a disk. Um, Wait, so then this comp we can think of this component as vanishing. We're just left with, the, with a single unknot. And so um, topologically, well, the surface that we have here is a cylinder. And so we've just uh, shown an example of concordance from uh, that knot up there to the unknot. Okay. So, so this is the knot concordance group, which I'll denote with the fancy C. Um, uh, so this is going through an unknot. I mean, so in terms of right, so on the one hand, it looks like sort of what we did was pretty violent. Um, if you do it again, you have to be careful because it could be that the surface that you create has genus, right? So if, if, you did, if you did this sort of move again, but you actually merged together two components, well, that would be bad because you wouldn't have a cylinder. You'd have a twice punctured torus. Um, but, but if you sort of keep track of, the, of, the, of how you're merging and splitting the components so you know, you know you're not creating genus, um, then you'll have a cylinder. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Yeah, oh yeah, but uh, yeah, so th this is an equivalence relation, right? So it's not hard to check. You can you know, turn the thing around, you can stack two of them. Um, great. <coughs> and so, so it turns out that uh, this is a group. Um, the, the identity is the equivalence class of the unknot, um, and knots that are, are concordant to the unknot are, are called slice. So k is slice if k is concordant to the unknot. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, so remember, so before we uh, quotient up by this equivalence relation, so sort of our, our objection was that this thing was a monoid, we're missing inverses. And so now, well, if I'm claiming this thing as a group, well, everything better have an inverse. And it's, yeah, it's not hard to say what the inverse of a knot is. So, uh, oh, so first of all, this group is abelian, so it's sensible to call the inverse of k is, well, it's denoted minus k. That's sensible. And what is this? This is the reverse of the mirror image. So I'll just draw a picture. Right, so here is a knot to get uh, minus k. What do you do? You change all the crossings, and you also reverse the direction of the arrow. So that's the inverse. Okay. <coughs> so. So we've defined this group. You might wonder, well, what does this group look like? How big is it? Um, <coughs> and so uh, Levine in the 60s defined a surjective homomorphism from the concordance group to z to the infinity plus z mod 2 to the infinity plus z mod 4 to the infinity. So. So I guess you know, if something is subjecting onto something that's infinitely generated, well, it means this group is fairly large. Uh, this this may, may make you wonder about um, torsion, right? Because you, you know, we're subjecting onto <coughs> uh, z mod 2 to the infinity and z mod 4 to the infinity. It turns out the only known torsion in the concordance group is of order 2. Um, and if you think about, well, what the inverse of an element was, um, you could say, oh, well, if we have a knot that is isotopic to the reverse of its mirror image, well, that's going to be order two in the concordance group. And in fact, all known torsion in the concordance group um, is concordant to a, a knot that is isotopic to the reverse of its mirror image. So basically, it's sort of <coughs> the obvious type of two torsion is roughly the only known two torsion in the group. 
Okay. So, so in, in our definition of the concordance group, we required our cylinder to be smooth. You might wonder, well, what happens if we relax that condition? <coughs> um, you might relax it all the way to say, well, what if we just require this to be um, a topological embedding? That, that, that's going a little too far, because then every knot is going to be um, concordant to the unknot. <coughs> so how can you see that? Well, take a knot in S3. If you take the cone on that knot, right, it bounds a topological disk. And then you can just puncture the cone somewhere. That's going to be a topological cylinder. But it turns out you know, there's, still, there's still sort of a, a weaker notion <coughs> um, of concordance. And that um, occurs if you replace uh, smooth with locally flat. And so locally flat uh, means that your cylinder has to have a product neighborhood. right? So, so the cone point. Um, doesn't have a product neighborhood, so we sort of got rid of that problem. So if you were. Yeah, locally flat, yes, it has a product neighborhood. That's right. Um, okay, and, th and then if you do that, you obtain the topological concordance group. <coughs> which will denote C top. Um, and so there's an obvious homomorphism from the smooth concordance group to the topological concordance group. Right? You have your smooth cylinder. You can just forget the smooth structure on it. <coughs> and well, so you have this surjective homomorphism. And you might wonder about, well, the kernel of this, which will denote CTS. Um, right? So this kernel is generated things by by things that are uh, topologically sliced, but not smoothly sliced. And so if we want to understand this kernel, well, you might wonder, well, what, what does Levine's homomorphism tell us about that kernel? And it turns out his, his homomorphism uh, is defined in terms of certain linking forms on surfaces, so in particular, factors through the topological concordance group. <coughs> so it doesn't say anything about the top of this kernel here. Um, but <coughs> so in uh, so it follows some work of Donaldson and Friedman that this kernel is non-trivial, and then uh, Endo in the uh, '90s showed that well the kernel not only is it non-trivial but it's infinitely generated. And then, well, you might wonder more questions about the structure of, of this kernel. And <clears throat> so work of Livingston and Manolescu Owens, they showed that um, this subgroup has a rank 3 direct sum and. Well, so we have something that's infinitely generated and has a rank 3 direct sum and. Well, the natural question is, well, does it have an infinite rank uh, direct sum and? And so uh, we have the following theorem, which is that uh, the subgroup uh, has an infinite rank direct sum and. And so uh, this proof relies on the sort of the the not invari or sort of the the not floor homology, uh, no, the not floor complex, which is <coughs> um, a sort of a variant of Hagar floor homology. So it's a it's a filter chain complex that you associate to a knot. The the filter chain homotopy type of this complex is a not invariant, but within the filter chain homotopy type, you can extract. Uh, various different numerical invariants that are concordance invariants. And so it's using these concordance invariants coming from the not floor homology package um, that I was able to define a, uh, a homomorphism from the smooth concordance group uh, 
to z to the infinity, and then I, I studied what this homomorphism looked like on this subgroup, and um, that led to this result. So I'll stop there.